ਅਸਲਾਮੁਅਲੈਕੁਮ long said my very well and and colleague who appears with me Saja Sati I happen to be Shahzad Hasan Khan and we hope and pray that everybody out there is doing wonderfully well and that you're ready to kick start your day with us but first things first hello Hajra assalamu alaikum how are you doing on a fine sunny Wednesday morning over here in Islamabad wa alaikum assalam thank you so much jazakallah khair for introducing me Shahzad so we were before uh, going on to the on screen we were talking about the coffees and the various flavors of the coffees since you're a coffee person Shahzad yeah. because you need coffee in the morning to boost up your energy Uh, so I would like to ask you do you know how many flavors of coffee are there I mean yes obviously I can name a few you know <laughs> okay. so there's uh, mocha yes okay this latte. there's uh, hazelnut there's espresso yes latte uh, there's latte yes there's uh, i don't know this frappe yeah, you know yeah. so there's so many types of it because you know more than coffee i think it's 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 a business now so you know people will always come up with newer types and you know yes. newer exotic flavors and what not or you know we have mixed cherries in it and what not <laughs> so i think but ladies and gentlemen while we speak of coffee you know because we did had um, the worthy ambassador over here on our show you Ethiopian, know who, the yeah, Ethiopian, Ethiopian ambassador. ambassador so Ethiopian coffee ladies and gentlemen happens to be one of the best, best in the world finest was well, yes. was really hard though you know <laughs> so you have half a cup of it and you like okay you know i'm good to go for the entire day but what about you are you a coffee person tea person no, no, lassi person i i think you know the answer so i'm caffeine free i am not fond of coffees and teas so I, this is the modern this is the modern era so i'm caffeine free and you know there's I, decaf I, it's, as it's, well it's, it's not it's not a modern <laughs> version of that in fact uh, so i our mother was always you know making us uh, drink a lot of milk because i don't know there is this misconception or something like that ke yeah. uh, kale ho jate hain bacche chai peene se right we all yeah, keep yeah, hearing yeah. that in our childhood i think um, it's, it's it's sorry aja but i so think sure. it's just because of the fact that we belong to a very middle class family yes, na where yes. having too True. many eggs were like oh garam hote hain you know or having hoda. cashew nuts was like garam hote so everything which was expensive in in a very middle class family ladies and gentlemen <laughs> happens to be you know garam hoti hai okay so yeah. i don't know even with tea probably but tea yeah, wasn't so that expensive I, I, though i i am fond of milk and the dairy products like lassi like yeah. milkshakes yeah. and i do yeah. get milkshake every fine morning because i think without milkshake and anda my uh, morning is really really incomplete wow. my breakfast is very incomplete but when we talk about uh, coffee so coffee was usually harvested by the arabs especially in the east and yeah. they were very fond of it um and uh, so so i think one uh, one time there was this uh, person who was a shepherd and he discovered that his goats ate that coffee beans and the goats couldn't sleep all night because they were so strong in the yeah. first place right and then he started discovering the benefits of that um and while in the west there was this perception since it is used by the muslims it is used by the turks it is used by the ottomans so um it is some sort of a poison in the first place because there was a lot of acrimony between east and the west uh, but now when you see so many flourishing coffee houses across the west you know uh, starbucks and what not right you would feel that it is a very inherent custom or yeah. tradition of theirs uh, but when i went to turkey there were so many uh, they call it uh, coffee houses kahve khane yeah. uh, so there are lots of kahve khane and coffee houses were some sort of a place where people would gather there was a public space where they could debate uh, where they could have the free expression yeah. free speech expression they were discussing the political ideas and sometime after that a uh, lot of sedition ideas also started developing in that coffee houses uh, so the ruler of that time sultan of that time he banned coffee houses in the first yeah, place because he said yeah. yes uh, so there's a lot of trouble brewing especially in the coffee houses because people are plotting against him uh, so for quite some time coffee houses were banned in the first yeah. place um, but lot of people and they, they, i was listening to this this course in the west that um, muslims were against the concept of the coffee which is never the case in the first place because coffee was harvested by the muslims and yeah. it was consumed by the muslims in the first and place where hajra actually mentioned that you know that it was actually the arabs you know who always yes. made sure that it's going to be their drawing room culture or probably the hujra culture i mean it's too hot over there <laughs> just to imagine having coffee in a desert ladies and gentlemen certainly does not feel like a great idea but where you spoke about you know lassi and all of that i would want to contribute so imagine that okay. you know while we were growing up you know our mother used to tell us okay beta you need to oil your hair okay uh, you know yes. beta you need to drink milk yes. beta you need to do this so all of that and right. we 
weren't obviously very careful about it. So we've always had a very uh, careless, <laughs> careless childhood. But all of a sudden, as I crossed my 30s, now I oil my hair myself. Yes, yes. Now I'm drinking milk every true, single day. True. I'm making sure that I'm going to put in some yes, almonds. Yes. Then the best part is, alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm so thankful to Allah Almighty that my parents actually have a very... Uh, uh, you know, rural background. Right. So imagine that we're going to get makhan at home. and Nutritional then you know, rich diet yes, in yeah, the yeah, home. Yes, yeah, yeah, desi ghee ke paratha. Yes, so, you know, you yes. imagine you take a bite from desi ghee ka paratha, That's you know, you take, a little, you take a little bit of butter which is which is being made at your place <laughs> and right. then all of a sudden there's good in front of you, you know, so you take a little bit of good on top of it and then, you know, you put a little bit of honey and then when you put and it Shazad in... And Shazad is in that typical <laughs> Tesla body <laughs> mode in the first place. So amazing. <laughs> and then you take right. a sip of that cup of tea where there's no sugar in it. Oh, 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 my God, what the hell? <laughs> right, right. So I think we move on to the news and top stories uh, before Shazad get totally lost in the flavours uh, and the culinary uh, designs get, in the first place. Started. So Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif and Turkish Vice President Jevdad Yilmaz will jointly launch the fourth Miljem uh, class covert BNS Tarek at Karachi Shipyard today, initiated in 2018. Miljem project envisages the construction of four covets for Pakistan Navy, including two in Pakistan and two in Turkey. The Prime Minister earlier attended the launching ceremony of the third naval corvette PNS Khaybar in Istanbul in November last year. The first two corvettes PNS Babar and PNS Badar were launched in Istanbul and Karachi in August 2021 and May 2022 respectively. The Miljem project presents an enduring symbol of pakistan turkey collaboration in the maritime domain. It is a tangible step towards self-reliance and indigenization and would fulfill the critical security needs of Pakistan wow. Navy. Uh, that's a wonderful initiative, uh, Shazad. And uh, the matter of the fact is that there's so much focus on the indigenization and making sure that there is a self-sufficiency in our security needs. I think that is the need of the hour and we need such sort of allies who would present or make us more self-sufficient in the first place. And it's, uh, so obviously, you know, I think on this occasion, we would certainly like to thank our Turkish counterpart over here. Mm -hmm. And yes, obviously, where credit is due, it's due. It's the vision of the Prime Minister, Mia Mohammed Shabash Shif Saab as well. But with that, ladies and gentlemen, heading yes. on to one of his team members who's been, uh, you know, working day in, day out to make sure that, you know, Pakistan is going to be on the road to prosperity. Finance Minister Sagdar has termed mining sector as one of the key drivers of economy and said government had established Pakistan Sovereign Wealth Fund to exploit potential of mining, agriculture and information technology. Addressing the Pakistan Minerals Summit titled Dust to Development, Investment Opportunities in Pakistan and Islamabad, he said the government is taking serious measures to facilitate investors and exploit potential of the resources of the country. He said further that the draft legislation for establishing the fund, which is more acceptable globally, had been tabled in the National Assembly and would be moved to the Senate on Wednesday. The Finance Minister said... Egypt and Indonesia, who were facing turbulent situation like Pakistan, had established the fund and were doing well. The finance minister asserted that Pakistan is an asset-solvent country and only thing that needed was the financial management and said even only in mineral sector, it was having potential of around $6 trillion. And we hope and pray that, you know, that... Uh, uh, this government or the government who's go which is going to come over, ladies and gentlemen, will be able to tap onto this sector and will provide us with $6 trillion because we certainly are in need. Right, that's very true and thank you so much for brilliantly putting it out. But Shazad, since the month of August have started yes. and I've Pakistan's always... Pakistan's in the world. Yes, uh, and you would see certainly there's a lot of green flags flying across your road if you're strolling through the streets. And when I was young, I was often, I used to wonder that uh, the terms like Qom, Vatan, Milla, these are just the floral uh, verbosity to grace a Urdu dictionary. But now when I've grown up, I feel no, it's more than that. You know, they make us a part of a whole called Pakistan. And we are really, really proud to uh, inhibit this soil called Pakistan. And especially if you go abroad, you would feel the difference that how much you miss your motherland, <laughs> Pakistan, in the first place, yeah, right? That's true. Um, and the, the, the vibe of the Pakistan, the language, the culture, the hospitality norms, and especially the hospitality norms, which are so vibrant here in Pakistan, they make you miss even much more, right? Yeah. Uh, and we are celebrating our Independence Day, uh, especially in the month of the August. And and we are going to talk more about the patriotism. And, and, and you know, that's exactly yeah. what, I, what I wanted to ask you, Haja, because, you know, I was certainly confused when Jim Shah Sahib gave us this topic that, okay, you know, tomorrow we have to talk yes. about it. I was, I was questioning my own self. I was like, okay, 
what is patriotism for me? So right. before I answer that, I would want you to answer what patriotism is for you. I think patriotism is that you look after the interest of your country before yourself and you tilt this question. So a lot of people are asking, you know, what have this country given to me? I think you need to tilt this question and ask, what have I given to this True. country? Because we make um, this uh, geographical terrain called Pakistan in the first place. We, the nation, make it. And this is what patriotism is for me. So I think a more responsible citizenship is that you look after the interest of your community, <laughs> your uh, country, um, your region, your interest in the first place. And this is how I define my patriotism because I have an undying love for my country and it is never going to drain away in the first place. Wow, that's wonderful. So, you know, I think it, it's my time now. And okay. uh, <laughs> so I used to work on a private channel, for a yes. private channel, you know, before before joining PTV, yes. you know, 10 years ago, it's been a decade, alhamdulillah, shukar, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And, you know, when, when I actually auditioned for uh, Pakistan Television World, ladies and gentlemen, it was a very different feeling and, you know, I had mm -hmm. mixed emotions from my friends. Wonderful. And I was like, hey, you know what, you know, I certainly want to represent this channel because, one, it's going to go out in 46 different countries. They will see a lot of youngsters sitting on television, probably yes. speaking sense about their country, science, economics and whatnot. And I think that's the kind of image we want to portray. And a decade down, ladies and gentlemen, alhamdulillah, we have been very lucky about it. And uh, since it happens to be the only English morning show in the country, yes. alhamdulillah, the kind of success Allah has given us. First of all, Lamia, thank you so much. You, know, you need to have this power of gratitude. And then, you know, making sure that day in, day out, you're going to give it your best, you know, so that you reap those benefits. So it's not, it's not that, that just the country is going to reap those benefits, but imagine that the number of, uh, you know, global leaders, the True. number of uh, ambassadors over here in True. the country have been on our show. Numerous political figures have been on the show, which means that you are being heard. And yes. that certainly, ladies and gentlemen, is a fulfillment for me and for yes. people who are out there. I think contributing every day, making sure that you're contributing towards the prosperity of the country will certainly have a direct impact on the kind of growth you're going to have. So please make sure yes. that you're going to put your work first and that too for your country first and then for yourself, that's patriotism for me. But whenever it's 14th of August, you know, people do have uh, a lot of motorbikes <laughs> and patakas and yes. you know what now, firecrackers. So to talk about patriotism, ladies and gentlemen, we're very lucky that we've been joined by a wonderful <laughs> guest. Because if I do not introduce my guest now, my yes. producer might kill me. Okay, I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, we're very lucky that we've actually been joined by somebody who happens to be one of our favorites. He happens to be a motivational speaker, ladies and gentlemen. He is Mr. Muhammad Abdul Wahab. Hello, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, Pakistan Zindabad. Welcome, Islam. Good morning, Pakistan, Zindabad. I am fine. What about you? Absolutely uh, perfect. Al Alhamdulillah, but perhaps we would like to continue our conversation when we talk about patriotism. So, and I would also like to tell this question and throw it to you. So, a lot of people uh, talk about, you know, what have this country given to us. But I think we need to ask the right question, which is that what have we given to the country, right? Very good. So, do you think this is the right question to ask in the first place when we speak about yes. patriotism? Yes. Uh, thank you that you have already uh, lightened my work. You both have been talking about patriotism without inviting me Is it because <laughs> I was invited for this topic. <laughs> <laughs> Please see, go ahead, uh, anyway, I, I was just kidding. <laughs> so, all right. You see, patriotism, uh, patriotism is unflinching faith hmm. in your country. Hmm. It's it's a love which is unique, really. You know, I mean, there is it. This love is supreme when we call what patriotism is. You have sheer love for your country. George Bernard Shaw had put it. You know what patriotism is. It's sheer conviction that your country is superior to all other countries in the world. Yeah. Why? Because you were born in it. Yeah. You see, that shows, I mean, there are people who complain, oh, if we were born in America, how? Great it would have been. Why were we born in Pakistan in a uh, development country? The thing or is, the other way around. Exactly. Exactly. The thing is, I mean, many people do not read history. They do not know where America is, how many centuries it took to reach the stage. We are hardly 75 years old, but we perhaps might have done much. Uh, I mean, unluckily, we couldn't do that. Right. But still, I mean, we are on the track. Hajar, I mean, putting things right, yes. this is perhaps the only country in the world which came on the basis of faith. La ilaha illallah. I do you see? Yes. This was the basis of our country. Right. At the same time, unlimited sacrifices. You see, do not forget th that we lost millions of lives. Mm. True. 
millions of women lost their honors while migrating. True. I usually term it bigger than the genocide of Rwanda back in 1990, yes. where more than one million people were massacred. But this uh, division which took place back in 1947, it had great emotional cost. Hmm. The wounds took decades to heal up. Why I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this background? Because if we have been reminding us about this background, how many sacrifices we gave, True. these sacrifices strengthen our belief in the country, in but Pakistan. How do you suppose that we keep the sacrifice alive, considering the fact that I think we are the generation, we are not aware of those sacrifices. So we keep hearing our nannies, dadis, yeah, our exactly. ancestors talking about you know, how difficult it was such a phase, but we are losing that generation, exactly. right? So how to keep that sacrifice alive in the national memory in the first place? Exactly. 14th August should not only be the day when we revive our sacrifices, when we talk about Pakistan, perhaps this should happen throughout the year. That's true. And what we have to do, basically, we have to tell how to really celebrate. The way we, Shahzad just pointed out, these motorbikes, uh, bikers, they go crazy. Azadi. Azadi. I mean, what is this, Azadi? Nobody has told them. True. Perhaps even I try to tell, they do not understand. Azadi is not sheer open display of wild emotions inside, unchecked emotions. True. You see, Azadi means that we have, if we love our country, mm -hmm. what are the prerequisites for showing your love? Right. Number one, that we have to develop this country. True. True. First, we have to make every single individual educated. Right. Because, because the first prerequisite. Right. Second, we have to provide every person reasonably good health facilities. Third, we have to have a country which is self-reliant. Hmm. We are not self-reliant. We are, our economy is import-based. Right. Number four, we have to really build our water reservoirs. True. We have to build a culture where everybody loves each other. True. We have to accept that we have five provinces yeah exactly <laughs> you know i mean we have we have five provinces we have to integrate them yeah now i mean there should be single word every person is pakistani there is no person punjabi True. balochi sindhi majar balti balochi whatever pathan everyone has to be pakistani they should be the only identity you see when we come to civic responsibilities, we have to behave like a responsible nation. Hmm. Hmm. When we say that we love, we are patriotic to the country, what does this mean? We treat Pakistan like our home. True. Ajra, when you are at home, yes. do you uh, throw away wrappers of anything? No, my mom would kill me. Do you litter away? I mean, for example, we are uh, drinking coffee right. and I'm, I'm a coffee lover as well. You see, I <laughs> really wanted to interfere at that time to tell my experiences. <laughs> and you have your coffee with you. Yeah, I right. do have, you know, but anyway. So right. basically what I was saying, we, we spill over drinks at home, never. Mm. Yeah. We do we litter, never. Do we, I mean, just uh, do wall chalking at our homes? No. We never do wall chalking at no. our homes. We, at the same time, we do not waste water when we are washroom because we know if we waste water tomorrow, we may not have water. I even turn off extra lights. Exactly. Yeah. When we do not leave our stove, yes. we do not keep it lightened. You see, right. when you make your coffee or tea or whatever, right. uh, immediately switch it off. Right. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. electricity, consumption of electricity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has been seen that you were sitting in drawing room for two hours. Yeah. And for last two hours you, in your bedroom, but all the fans, air conditioner, lights of the drawing room, they're still on. But thank you so much for focusing so much on the civic sense and being a more responsible citizen in the first place. But now let's talk about a challenge that I would say uh, is towards the patriotism, which is about the social media and the influence of so many competing ideologies, right? And I do feel that they are denting the patriotism of our young people, our younger generation. How do you suppose we protect ourselves from such sort of competing ideology on the social media in the first place? You are absolutely correct. Uh, uh, when I tell you, for example, you go, you go and buy a sacrificial animal from right. market right. and that 
uh, animal is too wild, what do you do? You don't kill that immediately because you have to wait until the time of sacrifice. Yes. Mm. You try to pat it, you try to take care of it, you try to, I mean... Uh, calm it down. Calm it down. Yeah. <laughs> At the highest level, you know, you, you try to use force. Social media is a reality. True. Throughout the world, you cannot... Uh, you can monitor it, hmm. but you really cannot stop it. Hmm. Why? Because the younger generation has got a channel to speak out. Our younger generation has been denied facilities for decades. They do not have good education. They do not have good transport. They do not have... Uh, they do have high fees. I mean, a student goes to a university and he has to spend 250 rupees or 300 rupees for a simple burger and a drink. True. You, need, you know, I mean, why we are denying all those bas basic facilities? When yeah. I was a student back in university, yes. back in 1992, a simple cup of tea with a burger bun, mm -hmm. that would cost hardly 5 to 7 or 8 yes. or 10 rupees. Yes, you see, true. we have denied the excess of all those light expense cafeterias in all the institutions and we have established five star type of bakeries over there you know just to take money out of the students to but, but in addition to said uh, to this you know there's one more thing which i would love to talk about now for example we certainly where we're talking about social media we certainly do talk about media and the production houses mm -hmm. themselves True. now what happens is that you know we do see that you know a lot of people and the kind of shows we have over here all through the night you know everybody surfing through channels and there's hardly anybody, you know, making sense. There's hardly anybody, you know, who's saying that there's a good news out there. So everybody has always been manifesting a lot of negativity, unfortunately, which ends up or results in people, unfortunately, not saying good words about their own country. And this is something which Allah Mia tells us that zamana mud se hai, zamane ko gali mat do. You know, so this is something yes, which I want yes. everybody to understand. True, true. That, you know, that zamana is actually run by the Allah Almighty only. Yes. You know, People so please make sure yeah. that you do not say anything bad about it. But what happens is that there's this, you know, domino impact on people and the audiences, you know, and what narrative builders do is that, you know, they kind of cater to their audiences just in order to create chaos. Now, how do you think that at a larger scale, at a macro scale, everybody needs to be so worthy of their own education and patriotism that they certainly are able to decide that, yeah, no, the country is not bad, people unfortunately are bad. Very good question, a very practical question. Patriotism is incentive driven. True. You take Canada as a welfare Bahad state, Allah right? Take out all the incentives in Canada, from Canada. People will start hating Canada, they will start migrating. You have taken all the incentives from general public. If you fall sick, you have only a big government hospital where you will die perhaps in the queue. True. If you go to any big hospital, you have to have millions of rupees in your pockets. One example, I am a student of a university. My father tells me, okay, 10,000 rupees is your fuel budget and you have to do uh, whatever right. you. And I have to go to university for 22 days. Yeah. One good morning, I reach fuel pump and I come to know 20 rupees per liter has been increased. Yes. And I start shivering. Oh, for last five days, what I have to, I'm, uh, uh, am I going to go to university on bike? Or am now I going to- How do I manage? Walk? Yeah. There, I see a green plate car and I come to know, this guy certainly takes at least 2,000 liters free from my people's paid taxes. So what he will do? Will he, will he remain patriotic? No. He will say, please modify the system. I am equal citizen to others, so I also have got the right to so live. So inclusivity and equality. Exactly. So basically what we have to do in Pakistan, Somebody gets, I mean, take the example of the poor girl who is uh, almost in a very precarious situation back in Lahore. Yes. You see, and we are still not sure what is going to happen. True. Culprits are still free. Yeah, so, justice. so if I do not have belief in justice system, what I'm going to do? Wonderful. I'm going to be patriotic? No, not at all. Please try to adjust all their realities in the favor of right. common man. Right. Please do not compel them to hate. You see, try to make them patriotic and patriotic people could only emerge when they get reasonable share out of the resources of the country. Mm. You see, that's why you, I usually say people will really, you know, perhaps they would start cleaning the roads themselves. We won't be needing all these cleaners. 
if they get three times meal, if their electricity bills are within the reach. Capacity, yes. My security guard was free. He got 25,000 rupees bill this month. His total salary is 20,000. And he perhaps, I, I feared he, he might die out of heart attack. So, I mean, will, will he really uh, try to hoist a flag on 14th August? He would say, no, 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 sorry. I need roti inside my stomach. Yes. Exactly. I need something. So, I mean, this is the right time. Our elite will have to really open eyes. The, the poor class of Pakistan, they also have got the same right to survive. True. You see, if we are not, if we are enjoying luxuries at the expense of poor class, I'm, I really fear. I have, I have so many fears. In and my thank heart. you so much, sir, you know, for giving us this lesson because it is, I believe, the most important lesson that everybody needs to learn. You know, maybe anybody from any walk of life, I think it, this lesson, ladies and gentlemen, and this message goes for everybody. You know, so patriotism, obviously, where Abdul Wahab Sahib has mentioned that, you know, it, it comes with an incentive. You know, that's something which is wrong on our behalf. You know, if it's coming with an incentive that, okay, what the country is giving you, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think that I'm going to label it uh, patriotism. Because imagine yeah. that, you know, if you are in love with somebody, for example, hypothetically, and you expect that, you know, they're going to do these, these, these things for you, what sort of a love is this? You know, that's no love. You know, love should always be without expectations. So please make sure, ladies and gentlemen, that when you are calling yourself as a patriotic, as a, you know, and you're labeling that, you know, you're that Pakistani, which everybody needs to talk about, please make sure that you have zero expectations. And even though, you know, I think that's a formula which I live on, and that is zero expectations from anybody true. and everybody, okay? The ex if you are to expect, expect it from Allah Almighty. That's Only true. thank that's you so much, Bhav Sahib, for being with us. Lovely to be in conversation with thank you. And so for much. everybody who's out there, ladies and gentlemen, we're heading out towards a short break. Once yes. we are going to come back, there's a lot, you know, which newly born babies actually expect from their mothers, you know, and, and, and it's, it's natural, Hajra. That's so that's what we're talking about. What is that one thing which the newly born babies actually expect from a mother after a short break? Good mm -hmm. morning. Welcome back and before going on to the break, we had a very constructive conversation regarding patriotism, regarding what it means to be Pakistani, how do you define your national identity and obviously at the end we are very very proud of our national identity in the first place and uh, also we were discussing about you know how our mothers tend to feed us, we were talking about chai ni peene dete because chai jo hai wo kala kar dete hai, stuff like that right. Koi ni mengi jiz ho, wo middle class gher mein jo hai na wo garam hoti hai. True, but Shazad. Okay, so there's a lot of expectations of your kids from your parents, yes. right? From especially from your mothers because mothers tend to see their kids and they're emotionally protecting them and also physically and spiritually also, right? Uh, but when a child is born, what sort of do you think protection does that child? Do you think children can recognize his mother in the first obviously, place? Obviously, obviously, yeah. you know, and that's something which has been uh, identified by science as well. Even yes. while they're in their True. mother's womb, they certainly know. And right. which is why, do you, when you see that, you know, that the, um, you know, when the baby is being born yes. and the mothers actually put them right next to themselves, you know, they, all of a sudden, you know, they're quiet, even if yes. they're quiet, crying, true, true. because they kind of listen the heartbeat of their mother, which they've right. been listening, you know, for the last four or five months, which were, they were in the womb. But now I think there's one question which I left everybody uh, with was that, you know, what does a newly born baby expect from their mother? Right. Ladies and gentlemen, and I think that it's a right of the newly born child rather than expecting the mother needs to fulfill it and that that the mother is going to feed the child and right. that's something which we are talking about today because it happens to be the world True. breastfeeding week from the first till the 7th of august uh, in accordance with world health organization united nations in, uh, international children education fund right. and then all the ministries kind of collaborate to make sure that we raise awareness on this subject right. and there's a reason hajra why we are observing this okay. number one because more than half a billion working women are not given essential maternity protection in national laws number one right. number two you know 
know, just 20% of countries require employees to provide employees with paid breaks and facilities for breastfeeding. True. Alhamdulillah, over here in Pakistan, now you get maternity leave. And paternity that too leave. paid. And now paternity leave as yes. well. But, uh, whether <laughs> paternity leave is going to contribute something which is questionable. But to observe this week, ladies and gentlemen, we're very lucky that we've been joined by a wonderful guest over here. You know, who certainly... Very charming personality. Will, yeah, very charming personality over here. And uh, she will certainly you know, make a lot of sense when she'll yes. start to speak because, you know, we had a great session with her just before the show. Yes. We're very lucky that we've been joined by somebody who happens to be a gynecologist, obstetrics. Uh, she happens to be from Advanced International Hospital, Islamabad, and she's at uh, Well Woman Clinic. You know, if you're going to look for her, ladies and gentlemen, we've given you the address already. Yes. She happens to be Dr. Hina Aisha Nadeem. Hello, ma'am. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. How are you both? Absolutely perfect. And thank you so much for joining us. So first things first. Why do you think it's important for us to celebrate and observe the World Breastfeeding Week? Well, uh, breastfeeding is something which is very important and which makes the basis of all childhood of all the babies world over. Now we know that 48.8% of the world's women population are actually into the uh, working um, class. They, are, they make the working class. But, not, you know, most of them, they... Um, for one reason or the other they cannot breastfeed their babies and now this breastfeeding importance actually is giving your baby extra intelligence if you, if you yes. compare the babies yes. who are you know breastfed uh, to those who are formula fed then you will come to know that the IQ levels of the breast fe uh, fed baby is babies is more high and if you see if what is the amount of infection or what the what is the rate of infection among the bottle fed babies is much higher as compared to the breastfed exactly. babies. Exactly. And and they get colic at times as well, which is why we have to get like some imported feeders for our <laughs> for our babies so that they don't get colic. But right. in addition to that, obviously as Muslims, even our religion tells us that a mother is supposed to breastfeed her child True. for the first two years of his or her life. And now, in addition to that, how important do you think breastfeeding is? You know, because obviously formula milk has paved a lot of way. There's a lot of marketing. There's a lot of cost which they have paid. True. And that's unfortunate. But how important do you think breastfeeding is? There are two is? aspects of the breastfeeding. One aspect is when you see it through the baby's side. Yep. Another aspect is when you see it from the mother's side. Let's see side. from the baby's perspective first. Okay. The, the baby will obviously, that maternal infant, you know, it's been a very long and... A, you know that old story that the maternal infant bonding will increase of course it increases and then it puts a positive effect on the maternal psychological effects as well it prevents the babies from certain kind right. of uh, infections early in their lives like ear infection like throat infection like lung infection like gut infection so the immunity is better the immunity is better another thing you know, uh, the bottle-fed babies, uh, they turn out to be more intelligent as compared to oh, the... Wonderful. Yes, and the breastfed babies, they turn out to be more intelligent as compared to the bottle-fed babies. Right. And um, another thing is that, that, you know, their growth is more, um, uh, you know, they optimum, they, they are more healthy. And so the socioeconomic pressure that the a family can face when taking babies to these days, you know, to the hospitals and paying for their health bills she and all, they, uh, that also reduces. So all such are the benefits of the breastfeeding if we, you know... Um, and now from the mother's perspective? Now from the mother's perspective, you will take most of the ladies over here, the working ladies, if we emphasize on them, of course, there's so many stresses that they face on their workplace as well as when they bear a baby. True. So, of course, they, uh, they are at the risk of producing that postnatal psychosis. Once they get busy with their babies, so that uh, risk of postnatal psychosis or postnatal depression, it also reduces that common um, concept that, you know, the mother will lose her figure or something is also a long gone story. It never happens. If the mother is taking good postnatal exercises, if her nutrition is good, inshallah, nothing bad happens to her. In fact, she loses her weight very good. Another good point is that, you know, when you're breastfeeding your baby, what happens that two kind of hormones are produced that actually, uh, you know, help you um, lose lesser blood right. in your postpartum period. And, uh, you know, soon after the uh, birth of the baby, uh, mm -hmm. for 40 days, there are irregular uh, bleeding. So due to those two hormones, the, bre uh, the blood loss is less. So there's less risk of producing anemia. Then you know what anemia does to a mother. Yes. 
so um, that are the benefits right. that can be uh, you know that can a mother can help by breastfeeding right. her baby thank you so much dr saiba for brilliantly and wonderfully putting light onto such sort of beneficial value of breast breastfeeding in the first place but now let's talk about what are the adverse effects of not breastfeeding in the first place and i particularly want you to comment with respect to the mothers and how they're more prone towards the ovarian cancers and the breast cancers and all of these diseases in the first place because of their low immunity see um, pregnancy actually it uh, gives comfort to your you know all the time working organs like your ovaries like your breast like your um, o uh, uterus so it is a sort of it is a time when they uh, take rest for a time overworking yeah working for longer time it yes. actually prone you to have certain cancers like ovarian cancers like breast cancers right. and now it's a, it, it these are uh, very you know researches have been done and uh, it's been uh, you know it has been researched world over that the women especially i can if i can take sure. the name of the country it's uk over there a study has been uh, performed which right. says that the over there the ma you know with the child bearing age has risen up to 30 plus right. so the rate of ovarian and breast cancer over there at an early age you know when okay. they are making up their mind like like they should have baby at 30 plus age at that time their risk of getting ovarian and breast cancer it increases right okay. so because why because the uh, safety that a pregnancy can give to a mother is you know prohibited is it is um, is is delayed right so their risk for developing this kind of cancers has is increased delayed. yes has increased the risk yes. has increased yes. or do you think that it's safer no now? if they are bearing the baby later, later. at 30 plus yes. age the risk is increasing okay and it has i think increased to more than 10 percent now right right i mean it's more beneficial to have babies in a younger age because obviously there is a medical benefit to it but dr saiba let's talk about the postpartum depression so whenever a, a uh, child is born obviously mother is going through a lot of changes emotional psychological physiological physical whatnot right and it's a huge adjustment to a new life a newer identity and how does a breastfeeding does it increases postpartum depression does it decreases is there a correlation between them please comment on that see um, when you when you pass through a very difficult stage whether it's a c-section whether a normal delivery you Allah Ta'ala gifts you with a you know with a baby right the only the look of the baby gives you so much comfort that you you know forget yes. every pain of your uh, life yes. you see and then cuddling your baby touching your baby it produces good hormones inside you right. it enhances your mood and you know th all those things that have been stressing you throughout they just vanish and you just think of your baby and your all your attention is diverted and focused towards your baby so this helps right. and you know i always believe that uh, medicines can do work but whatever is over here this yeah. will help you right. <coughs> you know which is why you know i would like to add over here so you know it's not just with the mothers yeah it's even the similar with the father so imagine that yes. uh, god forbid you know if uh, unfortunately uh, but that does not happen regularly but i because i do not want to comprehend it that way but if right. i'm having you know a low, low mood yes. a, a low, low mood time, you know i'm moment, like okay yes. you know what's happening and what not yes. not really interested in doing anything yes. you know it's it's always alhamdulillah either my kids or my yes. parents you know when i look at them i'm like happy and you know when when your kid actually runs towards you and, and gives you a hug and tells you daddy i love you yes, man that's so the different feeling that's yeah. the best time obviously that increases your dependence on on the love bit of it and everything yes. but you know i just love it shukar alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah but which is why you know i wanted to ask you that you know unfortunately I mean, I'm not sure about it since you're an expert, so you can tell that a lot of women might not even lactate for that longer period of uh, time, you know, probably one year or two years. And if unfortunately they're not able to breastfeed their child, do you think that the best alternate is formula milk or do you think that going down to goat's milk or buffalo's milk is something which yes. can be a better idea? Let's discuss the nutritional value yeah. of the See, milk. See, we are humans, yeah. right? And we are going to bore a human baby. Yeah. True. A cow will bore a cow baby yeah. the calf the sheep likewise All okay baby. now whatever allah taala is giving us is for our babies okay see now if you compare the but nutrition if you're not getting it that's what the question is true why not like we have medicine to promote lactation 
We okay. have medicine like. So there is no chance that a mother is not lactating. No, That's what you are saying. No, no. If there the is good, good, good <laughs> there is good pregnancy. See, first we start from the pre-pregnancy counselling. A couple should come and attend the attend to the gynecologist clinic and you know ask them whether we are ready to have a pregnancy. Because up to this is not those times. Ke stone age time. Hai, the doctor is not. In every corner, good practicing doctor is available. True, okay, true. if you are paying, she is going to give you, you know, all her expertise in, you know, uh, raising up your babies and, you know, covering all your pregnancy needs and stuff. So first is the pre-pregnancy counseling. Then okay. we come to the pregnancy care. Good pregnancy care is actually the basis of good breastfeeding. Wonderful. You know, and then we come to the postnatal time when actually the baby is here and when we have to support you know the the mother and the baby as well right. so what we are promoting these e these days is the baby friendly hospitals now what are the baby friendly hospitals where the mother feels comfortable she is prepared you know that how she will promote uh, breastfeeding and then the babies they are given to the mothers within one hour of their birth that is whether if it's a c-section whether it's a normal delivery whether one baby two babies three babies they are supposed to be handed over to their mothers in front of the neonatologist so that the breastfeeding it starts now we have two kind of breastfeeding one is exclusive breastfeeding then is the continuation exclusive uh, best breastfeeding is for the first six months no water no good tea Yes, I do believe in that uh, uh, Hazrat uh, used to give that uh, initial uh, khujur, uh, the ajwa khujur yeah. to the baby. Yes, I promote that. But other than that, no water, nothing, only the small quantity of minerals that a neonatologist will, uh, you know, advise you to the baby, like in form of calcium and all. Right. Um, that's it. And, you know, thank you so much for referring to it. And, um, you know, because we have this culture over here that whoever is going to give the kuti, you know, that the child is going to turn out to be like that. It's all a myth, first of all. Now, the question happens to be over here that unfortunately I've seen this malpractice within the hospitals that the doctor you were going to or the gynecologist you were going to kind of writes down a formula milk for you. That God forbid, okay, you know, if that happens, you can give this to your child. Now that's the major problem because that increases your cost in the first place and decreases the health of your child because imagine what happens is that okay, you know, so there's this bowel syndrome with a child, you know, there's something wrong with the stomach. Mm -hmm. You know, every time you're going to go visit a pediatrician and, you, and the doctors be like, okay, you know, don't take this milk, take this one. You know, so it's always the doctors referring, uh, you know, the, the parents that, okay, this is the kind of uh, formula milk that you need to get for your child and he or she will be healthier. Uh, because every mother would want their child to be strong and healthy and Coochie coo and all of that, right? <laughs> right. So, what's your take on that? Don't you think that that's a malpractice which exists with the uh, people who we call gynecologists or doctors themselves? See, uh, I belong to that class of gynecologists which who are trying to improve and change the picture of the ordinary, you know, the 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 usual gynecologist. Yeah. Okay. In my case, the fathers are there with the mothers. Yes, my anesthetist doesn't allow during C-section, but in the labor room, I'm the queen, so I let the husband stand with the wife because he knows how to take care of her. Yeah. I'll be there to keep a check. True. Okay. After that, um, you know, um, sorry, I'm uh, forgetting. Yes, yeah, so what I was trying to say was that it's uh, usually most of the time no. gynecologists who refer or kind of write it down on the prescription. No, no, okay, first of all, it's the skin to skin touch. Whether the baby is clean or not, the neonatologist receives the baby. She cleans, whether clean or not, she wraps it and in my case, for my babies, my babies are first going to uh, touch their mothers. See, we, we have to, they are going we, to because touch we are their short on time, so we have to wrap it up so that the audiences actually have a better idea. Yes. Don't you think that it's gynecologists most of the time who prescribe a formula milk? We do not. You do not. But are there, we do are not. there other gynecologists no. who do that? No. So the, how do you think that the, a, a parent that's does not dream about it? That's the neonatologist, brother. That's the neonatologist. If we 
tell them no you are not going to do it okay, of course they are not going to do it but that unitologist you refer to them as a doctor right we do not refer the unitologist is supposed to be there to uh, handle supposed to be there so the it's baby. always from the hospital that you get a prescription let's put it this way that okay ye formula wala but not the like. gynecologist oh yeah that's I, I not i'm not I, labeling i'm not I, labeling anybody i think i think that's a very interesting conversation <laughs> going on and we will carry forward but since we are really short on time so we would like to wrap up our segment thank yeah. you so much dr saiba for coming Here and very quickly, let me wrap it up for our audiences. So okay. imagine, I think that it's the parents' responsibility in the first place, rather than blaming the doctor, to kind of make sure that you have put in your own research. You know, yeah. unfortunately, if there are circumstances where you might, you know, there's no other choice other than formula milk. Okay, go for it. But yeah. unfortunately, you know, if you have not put in your research, you cannot blame the doctor yourself as parents. So please make sure yeah. that as parents, you are the ones responsible True. for your child in the first place. Rather than the doctor. doctor Sorry comes to interrupt you here. Certain conditions like tuberculosis, active HIV, and if the mother is on chemotherapy, these are the three conditions in which the mother cannot breastfeed. Thank you so much, and right. that's what we were referring to, ladies and gentlemen. Finally, we have a conclusion. Be smart, parents, and for everybody who's out there. Until next time, look after yourselves. One, two, three. Good, Good morning. morning. Have a great day.